whether that can be like public policy, um, MBAs, or regional studies, um, and among other things. So a lot of people in my program, I think everyone except for one person who did an MBA is in like a public policy program. And I um, chose to do regional studies because I my focus in undergrad was on China. Um, I spent a year in China through the Princeton Asia Fellowship. And so it's a region I'm really interested in. And although I'm really excited to be a generalist in the Foreign Service, I felt like I wanted to use my graduates full time to delve deeper into that area and get some experience doing like an academic thesis and doing um, the research like that in case in future I'm interested after the Foreign Service and doing a PhD program. Okay, I see. So, and you would do your PhD kind of as a separate, it's not part of the Pickering necessarily. No, no. Sorry. Welcome, Lily. It's so nice to see you and meet you. This is our first time. Um, I was just asking Bridget how she chose her program. Um, but we have also um, explained to the other uh, applicants or I mean guests in the info session that they can either put questions in the chat box or because we're a relatively small group, um, Bridget was fine with people just asking questions as we go along and I assume you're probably fine with that as well. Um, and I will um, share this, make sure that I can share the screen uh, with you. Uh, let me make sure that I'm doing this right. Um, okay, so did that help? Did that allow you to share? Uh, yes, it looks like it does. And my, oh. um, at the same time that that happened, my PowerPoint quit. So I'm going to go ahead and just hop in because I know that uh, Bridget is the star of the show today as an alum. I uh, am grateful to her uh, for allowing me to crash the session a little bit, uh, just to give a, a little bit of an overview. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Whitlow, it's really nice to meet you uh, virtually as well. Um, as Dr. Whitlow mentioned, I am the director of the Pickering Fellowship Program. I work very closely with Bridget as she's making her way through the program requirements for uh, the fellowship and I'm excited to be here with you all. I um, the program has now, so the, the Pickering Fellowship Program started in 1992 and has been in place, it, we've kind of fluctuated in the number of awards that we've, uh, that we've uh, given over the course of the year, over the course of the time of the program. I'm excited this year uh, to announce that we're actually increasing the cohort size. Um, so Bridget's cohort um, included uh, 30 fellows. This year we will be admitting 45, which is a, a big, um, a change from previous year. So I'm excited about that. I also just wanted to mention that I will be, uh, I'll mention three different programs in addition to the Pickering one, because I think because of the nature of the way that the fellowships um, operate, they're very similar. Um, so as you're considering which options are best for you, um, you'll have three that you can kind of um, look at as options. Um, so the Pickering program is a State Department funded program housed at Howard University. And it provides up to this year $84,000 uh, for a two-year two master's program in an area of relevance to the Foreign Service. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means because I know that's a highly specific, uh, there's a lot of components in that sentence. Um, but the program um, is uh, essentially designed to bring in um, excellence and diversity into the Foreign Service. So we're looking for candidates um, who have, uh, who represent the types of skills and characteristics that make a good foreign service officer. One that I like to highlight that is kind of outside of what you might imagine uh, from the 13 dimensions, if you've ever looked at that, is uh, resilience. So candidates who have had to come overcome uh, 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 challenging uh, circumstances and situations often make really excellent foreign service officers because uh, doing the work of a foreign service officer is very challenging. There are, you have to be worldwide available and certainly that includes places like uh, London and um, Buenos Aires and that kind of thing. But it also includes places that might be really remote. It includes places um, that might be very far from your family with large time differences and that kind of thing. Um, so folks who have had to kind of overcome um, challenging circumstances in the past um, may be well positioned to, to do well in the Foreign Service. And um, uh, because I can't sell you on the program if you don't know what you're signing up for in terms of the job, I do want to talk just a little bit about what Foreign Service Officers do. 
um, because ultimately the fellowship program of the Pickering and the Rangel fellowship programs are hiring pipelines into the State Department's Foreign Service. Um, so our fellows, Bridget, will one day become a Foreign Service officer, a diplomat of the United States, and they um, represent U.S. foreign policy overseas all over the world. We have um, 270 posts, including embassies and consulates and missions to different um, uh, uh, multilateral bodies um, around the world where our, fellow, where our uh, foreign service officers serve, and they do lots of really interesting things. Um, certainly the bread and butter of the department is um, working on uh, uh, immigration security type of issues. Um, so our consular officers uh, are those who kind of are the front facing area of, of an embassy. They do adjudication of visas. If you're um, overseas on a study abroad and you lose your passport, you're usually engaging with a consular officer to replace that passport. Um, we also have folks who work with government ministries um, to uh, coordinate um, uh, trade agreements uh, to make uh, business amenable to U.S. businesses amenable to operating in those locations overseas. Um, and then we also have folks who do sort of the outward um, outreach to work with international students who are interested in studying in the United States. So the work of a foreign service officer um, is very dynamic. You're always doing something different. You move every two years, two to three years, um, to serve in a different location, which adds to a, a level of, of uh, dynamism to the, the, to the career that's kind of exciting. If you're the type of person that is um, intellectually restless and likes to change things uh, every, every once in a while. This is certainly the career um, for you. So a little bit about the, how the fellowship um, fits into this. The fellowship program, um, as I mentioned, provides funding for uh, that two-year master's program in an area of relevance to the Foreign Service, and then also provides um, funding for two internships. Um, the Pickering program does a domestic internship at the State Department in Washington, D.C under usual circumstances. We are not in usual circumstances. I'll tell you a little bit about what we've done to kind of modify and Bridget can tell you personally because she lived through it these last 10 weeks. Um, but uh, usually the, the, they do a domestic internship in between their first and second year of graduate school and then they do an overseas um, internship at an embassy or consulate overseas um, after they graduate from their graduate program and they enter the, the foreign service as a U.S. diplomat in their A100 class during um, the fall after they complete their overseas internship. So all things remaining equal for next year, Bridget will be a Foreign Service Officer um, in the State Department in September of 2021, um, which is really exciting. Um, so let me just um, highlight a couple of other things. So in addition to the internships and the benefits that come with the, the program, we also have a five-year service obligation um, so you go through the, the two, you, you matriculate through the two-year master's program, um, you complete your two, uh, your, your two internships, and then you serve for at, at least five years as a foreign service officer. And remember I mentioned that foreign service officers um, move every two to three years. Um, that five years really blows by. It can turn into, uh, you know, two tours where you're doing um, language training before you head out and then you do a two-year um, rotation uh, wherever it is that they send you and then you come back to Washington DC, you do some more training and then by the fifth year, you're done with your second tour. Um, so uh, that, that is the five year service commitment is, um, does move pretty quickly. In addition to the benefits to the, um, for the graduate program, we do also provide mentorship. Um, so we provide um, a senior foreign service officer as well as an earlier career um, uh, foreign service officer who went through the Pickering Fellowship Program um, to each fellow so that they have some exposure to sort of what folks uh, are doing at the higher ends of their career and then what folks um, have have been able how to someone who's a little bit closer in terms of a peer group with you who can talk about grad school who can talk about thinking about your first tour um, who can talk about the internships and that kind of thing so the program is really designed to, to try to provide um, as much support around preparing to enter the foreign service as possible um, the selection process, and I just realized that there's a typo in here. Sorry about that. Always check your work. Um, there is a, the, for the eligibility requirements for this year, um, they are, we essentially have three core eligibility requirements to apply to the, to the program. You have to be a U.S. citizen at the time of the deadline. So as long as you have your citizenship in hand um, by the October 21st deadline, you're eligible to apply. Um, you have to have a 3.2 GPA 
um, from the institution from which you're graduating. If you're graduating senior, then you have to have a 3.2 by the time of the application deadline. Um, and then you have to be planning to enroll in a, uh, a two-year master's program in the fall of 2021. That's where my uh, typo is in this slide. Um, this year, the application deadline will be in October. We'll notify 90 finalists in November about um, whether or not they're invited to interview. And then we will conduct our interviews virtually um, December 15th through the 17th over the course of two days where you will do an interview with a panel and then a writing exercise. And then by December 18th, um, we will notify all 45 fellows and anybody who's applied about their status with the, the program. Um, I am going to just compare that with the Wrangell program just for a second, just so that you have information about both. Because if you're considering one, if you're considering the Pickering program, you should absolutely consider applying to the Wrangell. Um, the programs are identical, except for the, the time and location of the first internship. So the Wrangell Fellowship Program um, does their 10-week uh, domestic internship in, with Congress before they start their graduate program. And then they do their overseas internship in between their first and second year of graduate studies. Um, and then they enter A100, that class training class that every Foreign Service officer goes through in the summer after they complete their master's program. So the timing is a little bit different. Um, uh, and the location of that first internship is different, but everything else is exactly the same, including the application. So you might as well apply to both um, and uh, uh, double your chances of, of getting um, an offer for an interview. And again, the benefits have increased this year. Our, um, the award amount will be 84,000 over the course of two years for that master's program. Um, and, uh, the, and then the number of awards will, will also have increased. And then the timing for the, the, the Wrangell program is a little bit different in terms of the application period. Um, the application deadline will be October 14th. And then we'll notify folks on November 17th, whether or not they have been invited to interview. And then Wrangell will do their interviews on December um, 2nd and 3rd. So um, Wrangell finalists will be notified around the 5th or so about their status with, with the fellowship. It is entirely possible to be invited to interview for both. Um, and if you are invited to interview for both programs, um, you will do the Wrangell interview first. And then in the case that you are awarded the Wrangell Fellowship Program, um, you'll decide whether or not you would like to accept that or not accept it and move forward with the Pickering um, interview. I don't know that I've ever had anybody who has said no to the first offer that they've received, but certainly the, you know, there's always a chance that someone will say no. Um, but I have to let you know, if you decide to move on to interview for the Pickering, you would be um, uh, 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 removing your award so you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't be able to go back and then have your Wrangell award if you don't get the Pickering um, after the interview. Um, if you are not awarded the Wrangell, on the, um, then you will automatically keep your spot um, as a Pickering interview finalist. And the important thing here is that if you're not selected as a as a uh, uh, as a uh, interview finalist for um, for the Pickering program, um, but you're selected as an alternate, there is a very good likelihood that we will pull people up from the alternate list for the interview process for, for Pickering um, because we know that there is overlap between the programs. So it is possible that last year, for example, there were about 15 of our uh, finalists, finalists um, where uh, we had to replace those 15 and, and invite 15 new people to interview. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, that gets a little complicated. I can clarify with, with Q&A at a later point, but May I ask a quick question because yes. I think I just misunderstood. So um, what are the virtual interviews in December after they've already been selected? Um, no, so the, the, for the, uh, this is for the Wrangell program. They will interview virtually on December 2nd and 3rd. Um, and then in the case that, uh, and then the, the Pickering selection process is completely separate. Our interview process will take place two weeks later on the 15th and the 17th. So this November 22nd, when that's really oh, not. Oh, yeah, that shouldn't be there. I'm not sure how that, sorry about that. Oh, okay. The, I was like, the November, yeah. No, no. Okay. The November, the November 17th that, um, date is the important one here. On, on okay, day. thank you. And I'll, so I'll just mention a couple of, of really quick notes about two changes that we've made to our application because they're in, um, important changes. Um, one is that we've added a 300 word essay. So we, uh, we, the application is 
almost exactly the same as it was last year. We have a 600 word personal statement and then we have a 400 word financial need statement. Um, and then, uh, but this year we've added a question about organizing and planning. And this is um, one of the uh, foreign service um, 13 dimensions that um, we've integrated into a different um, way into this year's application. And this is really giving folks an opportunity to demonstrate one of the 13 dimensions in a more, um, in a deeper way. Um, so that's the, the core difference that uh, for this year's application. There are also a couple of small modifications that we made um, to the type of graduate program that we'll, um, uh, that we're able to fund. So usually the types of programs that the Pickering, um, pro, the Pickering and the Wrangell programs will fund include more broad level programs. Um, so public policy, public administration, area and regional studies, economics, um, business administration, those types of things. This year we've expanded that list just a little bit to um, incorporate um, some areas of study like industrial psychology um, and organizational leadership, as well as um, uh, master's programs with a focus in sort of um, immigration policy or uh, immigration law or international law. They do have to be two-year master's programs though for anything that has law related to it. They can't be JD programs and I, I just want to emphasize that. So you can still study that but it has to be a master's program. Um, and the reason why we've expanded that is be in, in part to be a bit more inclusive of folks who might want to pursue uh, the consular track, career track, or um, the management career tracks. Um, so those are some of the core differences in addition to the um, increase in numbers of, of folks who uh, who were able to award um, the program. I think I might hold all the rest of um, my comments. We can certainly take uh, other specific comments, but um, again, to kind of pass it off to Bridget, who I'm sure has some um, interesting insight here too. To say. Yes. All right. Um, well, I guess I'll just tell you guys a bit about my journey into Pickering and um, through Pickering thus far. and. Um, so as Dr. Whitlow mentioned, I graduated from UK in May 2018 with a double degree in Chinese Studies and International Studies with a French minor. So I was already split between regions, which is part, part of why I was attracted to a foreign service career. Um, then after that, I did a Princeton Asia Fellowship in Dunhuang, China, which is in the far western part of China. It's a pretty remote area. Um, and that um, I actually interviewed for Pickering from Dunhuang. I was doing Zoom interviews before it was cool, or um, Skype interview actually, it was Zoom. Um, but there I did, I taught conversational English to the staff of a uh, cultural heritage protection, protection institution, and also did some document translation. And I think that, that my experience in Dunhuang helped me become an attractive candidate to Harvard in particular. Um, they seemed really interested in the stuff I was working on and I was able to get a job at the Fairbank Center. Um, they're like the Fairbank China Studies Center doing translation work. Um, so I interviewed for Pickering while I was in Dinhuang, got that. Um, and I started at Harvard in the Regional Studies East Asia program in fall 2019. Um, and uh, it's been great so far. Um, my first uh, normal semester and a half were fabulous. The last um, half semester was kind of weird, but um, still had some really interesting coursework. Um, and this summer I was scheduled to do a domestic internship with the Department of State in the Office of South and Central Asian Affairs. Um, but because of the pandemic, um, those internships were canceled and instead we had a virtual professional development program it was developed by the Pickering staff and it was a very comprehensive program to say I, I think Lily knows the stats on how many speakers how many zoom sessions like it was phenomenal how they organized all of it um, so that involved a mixture of um, meetings with various foreign service officers um, former ambassadors um, speakers from varying uh, places in the State Department to learn more about foreign service life and the State Department, as well as um, writing seminars. Um, and we completed a policy, what was it called? Uh, 
a policy project. Um, we wrote a policy paper on an issue of interest, delivered a presentation, and wrote like a, a slew of um, State Department type memos. Um, and we also did some like oral assessment um, prep work and things like that. And so I, I'd say I feel like it's hard for me to believe that um, I'm not actually that new to the Pickering program because I feel like I just started. Um, but I feel like I've already seen a lot of benefits from the program. Like I, my interest in pursuing public service is what drew me to the idea of the foreign service in general. And so for me, the Pickering program seemed like the perfect way to get to pursue a career that interests me with, while still getting to get a master's degree, which I knew I wanted to do. Um, and I, what I think has been really exciting about the Pickering program so far is the, um, the networking opportunities and the cohort. Um, I love the people in my cohort. I only got to meet them in person for a week last year, um, but we've been seeing each other on Zoom for 10 weeks and they're all really lovely people. And the mentorship, the mentorship opportunities, as Lily mentioned, have been great. Um, we were assigned a writing tutor for this 10 week summer program and um, I really enjoyed talking with my writing tutor. We talked about not just writing, but also foreign service, State Department, life. Um, he, he had a lot of wisdom to share. Um, I have also really appreciated the support that the Pickering program provides in, um, in navigating the process of pursuing a State Department career, because it is a really strange and complicated process. So. Something that's been really helpful, I found, is the help that the Pickering program staff provide in helping us prepare for the oral assessment, um, like making sure that we know things about the State Department that kind of give us a leg up once um, we start implementing. So, yeah. I'm always having to forget that I'm <laughs> muted. Um, I just wondered, Bridget, if you could talk a little bit about, one, your application. Like, how did you approach it? Because 600 words is not a lot, really, to talk about all the things that you did. And then also, when you got the interview, what was the interview like? Because I know you have a writing uh, exercise in the middle of the interview, right? It's part of the process, which is a little bit unusual for most interviews or for awards. National, most of them are, don't have that. Yeah. Um, so I definitely spent a very long time drafting that 600 word essay and having a lot of people read over it over and over. Um, what I tried to focus on was making sure that my motivations were clear for not only why do I want the Pickering program, but why specifically this program, why do I want to do the foreign service as opposed to any other career in the world, like making that um, motivation very clear and also making sure that my essay told a story. Um, I don't remember which anecdote I used, but I used like a framing anecdote and tried to make sure that the essay was telling the story of Bridget as a person and Bridget as a potential foreign service officer um, who would really like to receive this fellowship. Um, and the interview process, um, as I mentioned before, mine was a bit unusual because it was over Skype. Um, but they'll all be over Skype now. Um, so it was um, it was an interview with a panel of I think three um, people, and it involved like just a normal interview part, um, and then also some like hypothetical questions about um, like hypothetical situations how you would handle them. Um, and yeah, the writing exercise I think I scheduled that separately, I think on another day with Lily, and Lily watched me type over Skype. Um, and it was sort of like the, it's the same thing in theory as like the uh, Foreign Service Officer test or any sort of timed essay where you're given a prompt and um, have to respond within a certain amount of time. And I'm sure Lily can speak more specifically about that if that's changed since I took it. 
So it hasn't changed. It will be very okay. similar. I mean, the prompts will change the, the types of questions. We change them every year just to make sure that they're not exactly the same in the case that someone is interviewing with us again. Um, but yeah, I think Bridget hit it right on the nose. It's a timed um, essay. Uh, we will give you a document that essentially gives you seven, six or seven different questions that you can choose from. They'll be structured pretty similar to the way that the GRE questions are. Um, so, you know, uh, we, uh, you know, it might be something related to international economics. It might be something related to a contemporary policy issue. It might be something we'll also include issues that might be less international and domestic, just so that everyone has something that they can respond to or that they feel comfortable responding to. And then you'll have exactly an hour to uh, respond to that. And I encourage folks to practice that if they have the opportunity to. Um, the timing part is often the, the most difficult thing because you find yourself, well, I'll speak for myself, you get down to the 45 minute marker and you're like, oh man, I only have two paragraphs on my page and now I gotta, I have 15 minutes that I have to work through this. Or I haven't had any time to edit. How do I get to, through these last two minutes and edit an entire four page document, for example, right? Um, so practicing the timing can be really helpful for the for the essay prompt in particular. And I would encourage you to go to the ETS website um, and pull off some of the GRE prompt examples that they give. Um, because again, the structure of the question is going to be very similar. It's like, here's an issue, pick a side, tell us why you agree, agree or disagree um, and why, and then support your, your, your statement. We're not really assessing um, what the substance of your comment is. Certainly if you go kind of really far off, the selection panel might think something, but they're really assessing your writing and how well you're, you are at articulating the point and then bringing in um, components to support your, your point. Um, and I want, just wanted to add one thing about the um, interview itself. The three people um, that will be interviewing you are the same three people that would have read your, your application materials. Um, and the questions that they'll ask you are essentially um, a couple that are motivational. Why are you applying to this? Why are you applying to this now? Um, why the Foreign Service? Um, there will be a couple that are uh, past behavior questions. So give us an example of a time where you've had to work in a team or something of that nature. Um, and then a couple of hypothetical questions. Here's a scenario. How would you respond? And even though the hypotheticals will sometimes be framed in the context of something that could happen at an embassy, you're not expected to know anything about how an embassy operates. The, the panel is looking for how you approach problem solving. How is it that you're using judgment in terms of who it is that you're asking for support and that kind of thing. Um, the intimidating thing about that panel, and I'm sure it's even more intimidating virtually, is that you can't read people necessarily. Mm -hmm. Our panelists are trained to not provide a whole lot of um, language, body language cues um, to try to eliminate bias. And in turn, as an applicant, that can seem pretty intimidating um, because they, you may not be getting sort of the head nods or the responses that you might otherwise see in, in sort of average, um, typical interviews, not average, typical interviews. Um, so don't let that intimidate you. That's just part of the process. Um, uh, if they don't immediately respond with something, um, it's not because they, they, um, they may not be paying attention or don't think it's a good answer. It's often because it's really time crunched. So we try to fit 10 questions into 25 minutes and that's a lot, especially since you all have so many interesting stories to tell us about yourself and why you're applying to these programs. Um, the, 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 the time can go by really fast. So they're mostly trying to keep on pace. Um, and in a virtual environment, that may be even more unique because you're not able to, I mean, even from here, you can't see me down, right? So I'm um, practicing, getting some practice from um, working with Dr. Whitlow or your career services center and asking to do and set up a mock interview um, could certainly be something that, that could help at least allay some of your anxieties and going into it if, if you're um, invited to interview. Which is why I strongly encourage for those of you out there who are potential applicants, uh, let's we practice writing and interviewing skills, right? I preach this all the time. There's a reason why we want you to practice and work on those skills. I would say to the students, um, uh, I see Michael there. He was brave enough to turn on his camera. But even some of you out there in the audience, if you have questions, I mean, this would be a good time, I think, to unmute yourself and ask or put it in the chat box if you prefer. Um, but this is a good time to ask uh, questions about Pickering or Wrangell, if you have an interest in either one of those, um, or the Foreign Service more generally, or um, Bridget's work in China, or being at Harvard. Like, th there's a lot of stuff you can talk about. 
um, in this time. Hi, uh, my name is Patrick Edwards. Um, I was just wondering if you could elaborate more on the uh, the more academic or like research based roles that a foreign officer might perform. So thanks, Patrick. Um, it's a good question. Um, I think from what I know of the Foreign Service, and I'm sure Lily knows more, um, that there are five cones um, in the Foreign Service. There's political, economic, um, management, public diplomacy, and consular. Um, and the political and economic cones uh, traditionally do more like policy analysis and writing, um, which is more similar to um, sort of academic research, but a very different style and a very different focus. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, that is absolutely right. And the uh, the type of work that political officers and econ officers have you if if you go to the State Department website, almost every um, region of the world has a human rights report. They also have human trafficking reports, those types of things. Our political officers and our economic officers are usually the ones that are drafting those. Um, they're also the ones that are drafting the cables and uh, memos that go back to Washington that influence what um, uh, the State Department's approach towards different regions and, and um, areas of interest are, right? So they're the ones that saying, this is what the context is here on the ground. Or um, we know that the, the president is really interested in name your policy in this region, um, our political and econ officers are usually, usually the ones driving that research. Thank you, that sounds very interesting. It is, some of it is very fascinating work. And you have to get it all in two pages, if you can. <laughs> is, it, is it encouraged for uh, foreign service officers that want to pursue those tracks to go ahead and get their doctorate? No. So the interesting thing about the Foreign Service, so our Foreign Service officer, the, the, the area that our fellows are going into, they're going to be Foreign Service officer generalists. They're the ones that are um, the ones that kind of operate at the, the um, what's the, the uh, what I'm trying to get at. They're the ones that are kind of operating at the, the implementation level. So they're not necessarily the ones that are crafting foreign policy, Congress and um, the White House, the executive and the congressional branches do that. Um, certainly the information that they're providing from post influence what, um, what ultimately the White House and Congress decide in terms of, of informing those policies. The State Department Foreign Service Officer Generals are the ones that are implementing those policies. And um, our generalists don't necessarily have to have any level of expertise in one d discipline or domain. Um, certainly you could, that doesn't prevent you from doing really good work, um, but you don't need it necessarily to do the work because you have to be kind of a jack of all trades going into, into this. As a political officer, you certainly could um, be working on, you know, one specific area, maybe human rights, developing the human rights report. Um, but your next tour, you might actually be in charge of the science and technology portfolio where you're actually um, working on, um, on a, developing or helping companies do sort of research and development in that country. Um, so you have to have sort of a broad um, perspective on, um, on foreign policy related issues. Again, you can have something that you focus on, um, but it is possible because our foreign service officers generalists have to be worldwide available that you could be working on issues that you don't have very much experience in. And if and in those cases, the department usually provides training that they pay you to do full time. Um, before you go out um, to learn those those um, those things before uh, they send you out to anywhere, they um, try to. And our officers also have access to training that gives them the relevant information and knowledge um, to to do that type of work before they get sent out um, to any post. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Um, yes, I actually have a question. Um, my name is Michael E. Geralimo. And I actually have a question specifically for Bridget. Um, Bridget, you had mentioned you had applied for the Pickering Fellowship while doing Princeton in Asia. Had you planned on applying for Pickering while you were still at UK? Or did you decide to do so while you were in China completing your Princeton in Asia Fellowship? Yeah, um, so I actually, I applied for the Wrangell 
fellowship my senior year at UK when I was applying for a bunch of things, trying to figure out my next steps. I didn't get it um, and ultimately decided on the Princeton and Asia program because I wanted to do something non-academic for a year and then see if that would provide some clarity. And while I was there in the first couple of months, I realized that I did want to go back to school um, and I had a clear focus of what I wanted to study. Um, so at that point, because I knew I wanted to go back to grad school, I started looking into ways to make that happen. And um, I think I had missed the deadline for Pickering my senior year at UK. I think that's why I didn't apply to Pickering. So I applied to Pickering and Wrangell again while I was in the norm. Thank you for elaborating. Like, I, I was asking because I'm personally planning on applying on some of these different programs to that kind of take place between undergraduate and graduate school. So I was just interested in hearing a little bit about your experiences. So thank you for elaborating. Yeah. And Lily, how long can people wait before they apply? There is an age limit maybe or no? Okay. There's an age limit on when you can enter the service. Um, so uh, you would have to be the oldest you could be to apply to the fellowships would be 56. Um, because the age limit is 59 to enter the foreign service. So we don't have an age limit. Um, our programs are geared to folks towards folks who are um, pursuing their first master's degree or who might be career changers. So in that case, um, our, our fellows tend to skew a little bit younger, but that's only because most folks are going in pursuing graduate degrees sometime in their sort of mid, tw mid to, to late 20s. Um, but we've had fellows who have come in with 10 plus years of experience um, as teachers, for example. I can think of one woman in particular who came back and um, decided she wanted to do a career transition and did a, a public policy degree. Um, and we've also had fellows who have come straight from undergrad who have decided that this is absolutely the career that they want to do as early career professionals. Um, so we've had a kind of a wide range of, of folks in that mix. Okay. Other questions from students or other comments? Any other things that would help you? It's a, I know it's hard to know sometimes what to ask, but I hope you won't be afraid to ask because this is the kind of thing the minute we hang up, you'll be like, oh, I should have, you know, asked this. Um, but this is a wonderful opportunity, I know, and I know we've had two Pickerings in a row, so we were really proud of Ben Troop and, and then Bridget. Um, and we had a Wrangell finalist this last fall, but we didn't, uh, and she did not receive the award. So um, I think students shouldn't be, uh, UK students shouldn't be afraid to apply. You can be very competitive and it can be a wonderful opportunity for you. And so I strongly encourage you to um, to start planning now. It's a good idea to start well in advance, I always think, um, preparing your materials and thinking about your recommenders and who you, um, and my office is happy to provide support for those of you who are UK students to help you think through maybe the approach you want to take in an essay. Um, it's, it's oftentimes, as Bridget was saying, I mean, it, it takes a lot of time actually to think about the approach that fits you and your particular experience. It's not easy to, you know, to, to write the essays, but it's not easy for anybody. So you shouldn't worry about that if it's a little bit daunting. That's just part of the process. And I'm happy to share my email address. Um, I wonder if you guys, if you would like to contact me with any questions. And they would you want to put it in the chat box yeah, and then they yeah, could can see that. it if they... Um, yeah, I'll do that. Um, I will say as well, I was extremely intimidated by the Pickering process, especially after I had applied for Wrangell the year before and didn't get it. I almost didn't apply again because it, it's a lot of materials. It seemed scary. There were only 25 finalists, and um, but I did it and it worked out. So I would say don't, don't be intimidated. Just start early and reach out to people like Dr. Whitlow and trusted resources and people who can help you read your essays and prepare for interviews and yeah. And I, I assume that you came back, Bridget, to a lot of your UK faculty for recommendations, right? Mm -hmm. As well, I mean, I know you were on the PIA, but you still had those connections. Um, yeah, my recommendations were, um, I think there were, one was a former supervisor from my previous State Department internship and my other was a 
uh, UK faculty. One thing I will mention, and Lily, you can confirm this because I this is what we've been told in the past. I always get this question from UK students. We have a um, an international diplomacy and economics degree here in the Patterson School, but it's a three semester program. And I have been told by Pickering in the past, it must be a two year master's program. And I just want to confirm. Okay, so uh, just want to let you guys know that um, if you're looking um, into these international diplomacy programs of which there are several, but uh, you, you want to have a two year program that is part of the requirement to make it an eligible program. So that means the Patterson School program is not, does not qualify for this particular award. Um, the one the one thing that I would add with the um, graduate programs is that we also have a list of uh, institutions that have, it's about 40 institutions that have committed to providing additional funding uh, to Pickering fellow, Pickering and Ringel fellows who are admitted to their programs. Um, you can check out the, the list. We have the general list on each of our websites. Um, we can certainly provide you with their offers, uh, what it is that they offer. The only reason we don't post that is because it changes every year. So keeping it up to date, we want to make sure that we send you the most up to date um, copy of it. Uh, but they can include um, also benefits for finalists. So even if you're not, um, uh, you don't get to the point where you're admitted this year, um, many of the programs also extend uh, financial benefits to finalists as well. That said, you're not beholden to those 40 schools. You are also welcome to take your funding to other institutions that meet the requirements. Um, the the two-year uh, two degree programs uh, in an area of relevance at a US-based institution. Um, and we have had folks who have gone to programs that are not on our list. Um, we have ultimately brought those institutions onto our list, um, but uh, they the fellows have often been the, the trailblazers um, there in creating those relationships. Um, and Lily, if a student should apply for a graduate program and they say, this is the program that I'm going to go to, and they don't happen to get accepted to that program, I know that would be very rare, rare with the caliber of these students, but let's just say it's, mm -hmm. they're not accepting much of a cohort that year. Are they allowed to then go and find another program to fit yes. and still keep the award? Okay. All right. Yeah. So what, what's ended up happening in um, most of the time this happens if someone uh, kind of puts their eggs in one basket and they can have their eyes set on one program and then they don't apply to multiple. Um, the last two years I've actually seen the opposite are where our fellows uh, get notifications from these different institutions. They're like, well, you offered me the fee waiver, so I'm going to apply. And they apply to, you know, seven or eight different programs. And then the challenge is deciding between those programs. But in the case um, that someone applies only to one, we will do, we actually have pretty strong relationships with the institutions that are on our partner list. Um, and we have uh, uh, been able to, to work with the grad programs to admit um, uh, fellows who may not have been admitted to, their, to the initial program that they were looking at. Now, fellows do have to be a little bit flexible because the, you know, while we may not be able to get you into uh, Princeton's fully funded program, we might be able to work to get you into you know, American University or George Washington University um, into one of their programs, which are also really excellent programs. Um, so I uh, would mention mention that as well. And we do a lot of work. Uh, the timing of our of our selection process this year is a little bit um, different. It's a little bit more delayed. Um, so you won't know until December. And by that point, there are programs that will, that have um, their deadlines in early December. So I would, as an applicant, monitor those really closely. You know that Harvard's program has a December one deadline, as does Yale, I think. Um, so if you are considering those, certainly submit your applications um, by their deadlines because we can't guarantee that they'll um, make accommodations for fellows. Um, but most programs have sort of early, uh, early winter deadlines in January and February. So you'll know before you start um, to finalize all of your graduate, most of your graduate applications, um, whether or not you have funding, which does end up being sort of a, 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 a benefit for the programs as well. Um, the one thing that I would, that, Another thing that I would mention in this area is that don't hold off on, on um, taking your GREs. If you are interested in some of these programs, um, they will, while we don't require the GRE, they will. So if you have the opportunity to take it during the time of the application process, we would certainly encourage you to do so. It makes even more of a case for you uh, as, as they're looking at admissions um, decisions as well, particularly for additional funding, right, for some of the programs that might be more expensive that uh, where our uh, $42,000 doesn't actually go that far and it's an $80,000 price tag per year. 
um, you do want to make yourself the most competitive for the other types of merit awards that they might be um, able to provide you. Um, so the GREs are certainly one place that they use um, that information. Um, but you will need to apply to the graduate program separately. For the purposes of our application, we're just asking that you tell us where you intend to apply, recognizing that that may shift and change depending on um, whether or not you're admitted to the program. Okay. And I have one other question for Bridget if the students don't have a question. So, um, Bridget, you talked about meeting your cohort for a week, and then I understand, you know, the world has happened, you know, and we've all been involved with COVID. But in, in ordinary circumstances, or do you know, I mean, you were online with everybody this summer, but during the academic year, are there contacts between all the fellows or are you all independently doing your graduate study and then you come back together in the summers? Um, so in terms of like formal mechanisms, it's mostly just coming back together in the summers for the internships, but in terms of informal interactions, we have a very lively group chat. Um, okay. And I actually live with two other Pickering fellows, so I network with them every day. Um, and um, I would say also they're pretty um, solid networks of people. Like there tend to be clusters of people going to the same school. So I think a lot of the Pickering fellows and the Wrangles and the Payne fellows um, who are at a certain institution, we'll kind of group together and go to events or um, things like that. So I'd say it's a, there's quite a bit of interaction, um, but it's a lot of it depends on individual like motivation and taking the initiative. Like if you go to a school out in the middle, like without any other Pickering or Wrangle fellows, you might have to be the one to bolster those ties. That's a wonderful um, asset though of the program too, just the community of yeah. the fellows um, at a stressful time and doing a lot of work. Yeah. That's great. Um, I want to say as well, to the point of talking about applying to grad schools, things like that. Um, something I was confused about when I was applying was whether my choice of program affected my application, but it doesn't. You're just applying for the Pickering Fellowship and you should also be simultaneously applying to grad schools. So I applied to, I think, before I found out I um, was a Pickering finalist, I was in the process of applying to a few grad schools. After I found out I was a finalist, I applied to a few more, and then I let things shake out. And I ultimately um, selected a program that is not a partner program. Um, and they decided to match the funding. So apparently that happens a lot or maybe not a lot, but it happens. So don't be intimidated if you find out that you're a finalist, if a school isn't on the partner program list, but you really want to go there, um, oftentimes they really want to have Pickering Fellows. So just cast your net wide. Um, and Wonderful, that's great advice. Thank you, that's good to know. Thank you very much, Bridget. It's lovely to see you. It's been a long time. Good to see you too, it has been a while. And Lily, thank you so much. It's very nice to meet you. And um, we would have loved to welcome Pickering back to campus because we did an info session last fall, but that's just not practical this year. So thank you for agreeing to help us out today. Absolutely. And thanks to the students. I really appreciate that you logged on and we will have um, this archived on the website so that you can go back and look at those slides uh, that Lily put up so that if you want to check your memory on something in your notes, uh, you can look at that again, or you want to remember what Bridget said about graduate schools, you'll be able to check that. Thanks all of you very much. I appreciate it. Take care. Good luck this year, everyone. Bridget. Yeah, thank you all. Have a good rest of your summer. Last couple days. Thank you. Summer's over. We start classes on Monday, you know. Oh, Yeah, wow. it's a week early this yeah. year, so UK will be starting very, very shortly. In the meantime, we're all COVID testing, right, Michael? and reporting every day, our health check. So it's an interesting environment to start a graduate, to start school, yeah. Yeah, stay healthy, everyone. Yes, yeah, stay healthy, everyone. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.